that was awesome. Yeah, and then we had a good time. Um, so for those of you who uh, rolled with the, with the camera and that idea, it was super cool. And for those of you who stuck around, I think that's super cool too. So um, what we try to do in the first week is make a case for why you should attend the class. And so actually, let me, let me start out. And the sounds like I'm going to do a little bit of logistics stuff about um, turning in the assignments and whatnot and getting calibrated. So we'll just do that right away, right now. Um, first, help, by show of hands, how many people got a chance to review some or part of the lecture that we attempted to record or yesterday? So some chunk of you. And how many of you, if you don't mind asking, looked at the slides for tonight and my preview for tonight? That's good. Okay, so it's you. Those of you who raise your hands are going to be able to help me figure out whether or not we're going to continue to run it that way again. Because if you've looked at the slides that we're going to be talking about, I'm not going to be talking about them a great deal tonight. And you've looked at the pre-lecture. We can figure out whether that model works. My hope is that it does, because then we can layer our prep work, the quasi lecture, whatever it takes to do that, on top of that, and focus all of our energy on having a dialogue beyond the slides and spending time digging into the to our guest speakers because our guest speakers are really cool, way more interested in hearing you talk, way more interesting than hearing you talk. <coughs> but it sounds like my ability to use Canvas is not all that awesome because we struggled to, uh, Canvas struggled to update you when I made changes to the assignments, so I'm doing something wrong there, I think. I'm guessing some of you did get uh, reviews and things assigned. that Fair. Yeah, basically, and those of you who emailed me and told me it wasn't working, thanks. That's like precisely what you should be doing, right? When things aren't working, call me or email me so that I can figure out how to fix them. That way I know what's happening. So here's what I'm proposing that we do um, around the first assignment from last, uh, that is, was, the assignment itself was due, whatever due means, on Monday to give you guys enough time to review other people's venture concepts. That didn't work out as well as I hoped. So my sense is, is that uh, what I have is a classroom full of folks that some of you have actually venture ideas kind of embedded in your head that haven't made it on the paper. Some of you have flooded my inbox with ones because the assignment is locked and you couldn't submit it. So I've got like a pile of those. Some of you, like little good students, by Hermione Granger types, got it all handled correctly. <laughs> Right, like, I think he's the only guy like who did it, right? And so, so we have that here. And uh, is there anyone in that pile that I'm missing? Is there someone who's like utterly confused that there was something to do? Okay, good. So there's no one confused that there was something to do. So now let's figure out what to do about the fact that it all got done heterogeneously. Um, what I would have done, uh, I have a couple activities that I would have engaged in before our guest speaker, we can do both of them. I'm going to modify the first one. So rather than have you guys dialogue with me about the venture concepts that you reviewed and what you thought was good about them, we're not going to do that. And what we're going to do is the following. For those of you who have not yet turned in your venture concepts, please, if you're struggling to do that through Canvas, send them to me. And is there anyone who can't accomplish that task by what it, Monday. Okay. Good to see you. Are you in my class? You're graduated. Damn it. Just, but thank you for coming. So, um, this is not uncommon. For those of you who are wondering what people do wander in and out here, my classes are open and free to the public, which means some of you are paying customers. Thank you. Some of you aren't paying customers. Thank you. Right? And uh, it all works out in the end. No one gets hurt. So just, that's, if you're wondering how that works. So if you have partners, friends, spouses, people that you want to do something mean to, you're free to invite them to come to class and be subjected to this sort of nonsense. So, as I was saying, can we reboot and have, for those of you who have not turned in your three venture concepts to me, can you get them to me via email by Monday of next week? Is there any disagreement about that? None. Okay, is that a fair and just solution to a technologically inhibited first week? Valentine's Day and technologically inhibited first week. All right. 
So we have one agreement. And we you your concept. What's, can you provide me, can you tell me what day one is? Twenty second. Oh, twenty first. No, no, February, February, Monday. So two twenty five. Please turn in your three venture concepts. And to get us back on track, please take one of those three venture concepts and engage with it as per the syllabus and as listed in the. Uh, in the in canvas, the instructions and access to one full baked venture concept. So you have three drafts and one more amplified. Any confusion about that? And this is due three days after that to be the 28th. Is that a day? Yep. Awesome. <laughs> 228. So I think at this point we're like largely synchronized. Three venture concepts by the 25th, and one built out full one. So once three ideas by the 25th, one full venture concept by the 28th. Are we going to talk about, about the detail of the concept? Those more details. Yeah, I can. We can talk about it tonight. Yes. So I think that gets us that move that gets me in a position where I have what I need to work with with you guys around this stuff, and no one's made wrong, there's no issues with the assignment itself. I'll do what I can do to get better with Canvas, apparently I'm a Canvas rookie, and I apologize for that, a lot of the hiccups are going to be associated with Canvas, so please be patient, and as always, um, if you can't get what you want through Canvas, or you have some confusion or irritation, or something's not working, that's, you know, emailing me gets a response, you're not going to get thrown into the filing bin and never heard from it, I will actually. So we have that. So that's the that's my that, that was my piece of logistics. Is there anything else on the logistics end? Any confusion, questions, things that are in the way that are going to prevent you from focusing on the class as it moves forward now? Is there anything in, any learning inhibiting questions in your mind logistically? Yes. Um, I have one question relating to the second part here. Uh -huh. Some of these ideas, at least for me, are pretty cool. And thinking about different entrepreneurial opportunities. If there's other ones that come to mind, do you want us to stay specific to those three and choose the one, or can we uh, choose a different one for this second assignment? That's a great, so the question here, yes. the, the issue for me is, as we, as we really emphasize on our first class, my interest is, in get, is getting you as participants on the court. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Yes, yeah, so the objective of the course is to guide you through the process of discovering a durable business and at the end of the day after 10 weeks give you the courage to know at any given point in time that you can go out and do that on your own. So, and a good chunk of what we talked about when we were together with uh, on the Valentine's Day is that uh, in order to do that we're going to spend a lot more time on the court than we are doing lectures and even more, less time doing lecture stuff than before because I'm going to try to preload uh, the lectures by delivering them on Canvas along with the slides ahead of time. And so if I'm on the court, if we're on the court, how can I, and I showed a slide that showed like, was it like a Lego battleship? And one of the challenges with classroom business plan chat issues is you end up building these Lego battleships, right? It's not a real battleship. It's a battleship made out of Legos. It has all the emotional invest, all the IQ required to build a Lego battleship, which is, of course, not what you need to build a real battleship with. And you're about as emotionally invested in that sort of activity as you would be with a Lego battleship, which is to say, I'm as, you know, you're as invested as you, know, you would be for any school project. And so since we're on the court, and learning these sorts of things requires a level of commitment to them, the best thing that you can do is to pick projects that you actually care about. And if that means that yesterday you cared about Project X and now you care about Project Y, so be it. I would rather have you do that. And we talked about this a fair amount in the, for those of you who didn't get a chance to watch the, the actual full-blown lecture that you produced, you know, I'm wandering in and out of frame, the audio is useful. But one of the main points I tried to make in that lecture, in addition to making the case for the class, like why you should be here and not drop this class and read a book or something like that, 
is that um, the entrepreneurial phenomenon is really common, right, and not so surprising that lots of people engage in it. And that we tend to, in my view, take an over-socialized view of building billion-dollar companies or splicing the genome or solving some major problem. Right? When we, we teach these classes, the underlying assumption is that's what people want to do. And we did a little informal survey when we were all together at Valentine's Day, me and my 12 or 15 BFFs. And, <laughs> right? the, the joke, of course, is none of us in that room like that night, none of us wanted to splice the genome. None of us wanted to build a billion dollar company. There are particular projects that are near and dear to our hearts, and those are the things that we want to build. And although I am not suggesting that if any of you are ambitious and want to build a public company, that you not do that. I've been very fortunate to be a part of founding teams and growing companies and taking the public, and it's really, really interesting and fun. But at the end of the day, that's not what most people want to do with their lives, and that's completely okay. And so one of the main kind of conditioning folks I have this class is we're, we're taking a very big tent view of the entrepreneurial phenomenon. We're assuming that we're not all going to build iPhone applications and split the genome, that small businesses and medium-sized businesses are interesting and fun to build. And one of the final cases I made about the interesting and fun is that, um, and which I can do with you guys, how many of you have like worked in meaningless jobs with weird bosses who are kind of a pain? How many? So at least half of you. For those of you who are one of you who showed up, for those of you who didn't raise your hand because you have a great job, lucky you because most classes that I have um, have folks that are not stoked about the managers, most of the managers they've ever had in life. Right? The job that they've worked in, the job they have is a little alienating. Oftentimes, the uh, managers that they're working with aren't very good. Right? And so, what I'm trying to communicate is one of the coolest things about being an entrepreneur. Besides like making trouble, it's like one of the few places you can actually cause trouble and get paid, which is great if you're a troublemaker. Um, the coolest thing about being an entrepreneur is the privilege of being able to create this little micro island of justice, a place in which you can create an organization with one, two, five, ten employees, where it's an interesting place to work, where, the, where, the, where there's meaning to the job, where the people are getting well managed, and as a result, they can go home and be better partners, they can go home and be better pet owners, they can be better parents to their kids, all this kind of great spillover effects. Simply by providing employment stability is the fancy academic word for that. Right? Entrepreneurship and small business provides employment stability and can also provide um, beautiful, a, a layer of justice to the job, which is largely So by and large, those are the cases I was trying to make for why God and I become blacks. And be here rather than doing something like that. Um, we're going to get on the court starting today with these issues. We're going to produce metric concepts that become the ideas that we create, um, that we run experiments on, so that we can begin to pivot and stress test our original business ideas, which, as we discussed on Valentine's Day, by, de by definition, the first business idea that you have sucks. You're just unaware of how sucky it is. Our job is to just assume generalized suckitude for all business ideas that we originally had, every single one of them. And our job is to quickly find our way through experimentation to business ideas that don't suck as bad. And ideally, ones that work. What do I mean by work? Well, when we're engaging in the experimental process, we'll be able to instrument to get results. Uh, and results. And through, yeah, good idea. Uh, good to see you. Remember, remember Suicide Guy from uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is so, it's, I'm, it's so great. We were worried about you. Every week, seriously, welcome back. It's great to see you. So, you're all missing. There's an inside joke. We had this, he came in a couple, like in the adventure class, sat in on a guest speaker who, it was basically, he was, one of the courageous guys raised his hand, well, this is really true, and why should you really blame it at all? But then after that, he didn't come back, so we'll, we call him suicide guy. <laughs> He's obviously not dead. He's a really nice guy. I'm totally stoked you're here. Are you registered? Are you just visiting? Oh, congratulations. You're actually going to custom. That's even better. Don't die. <laughs> 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 so, 
So we want to manage the experimental process somehow that we're going to be engaged in. And in the process of doing that, we're heading trending towards this thing called the viable business model, which is the uh, thing that we we're going to talk about tonight. Because in order to understand uh, the thing that we're experimenting, we need to know what sort of thing we're experimenting for. Oh yeah, here's what I said about that. And oh yeah, except I do. Uh, another thing, one small thing I want to mention <coughs> is that um, we also agree, uh, and you guys are stuck with this agreement because you weren't here. Everyone who was here for Valentine's Day, we decided that the startup failure rate, which is seven businesses out of ten, or nine businesses out of ten, is a venture back startup. We decided that that's not a natural law like gravity. We just chose it for ten weeks to suspend that agreement. So this is a social agreement. The social agreement is we've all accepted the start of failure rate is seven out of every ten. And we as a little small community have decided just for ten weeks we're just gonna pretend that that doesn't really exist. We're just gonna ignore it. We're gonna assume that it's an arbitrary agreement and we're just going to suspend it. Just for fun. And then after the class you can go back to believing that everything can fail. In class, for 10 weeks, you have to pretend otherwise. So, okay, so now we're moving into some new content, and we're going to move into a quick exercise, and we're going to bring our next speaker in. I promise not to crash through the uh, slide deck. So, here's the underlying conjecture. <coughs> the second, kind of after this class, the first after this class is why you should take the class anyway or more actively the insight that um, the insight that, that business opportunities don't exist out there in real life. They're not real physical objects or things that you go look at. They're invented by you as an entrepreneur, which has very powerful and profound conclusions in which we talked about in class last week. And the important thing to reinforce it on that is Ex ante, at the beginning of time, when you have a venture idea, you need to have asking someone for advice about whether that idea is good or not is completely crazy. Because it is not possible, given the fact that businesses are largely operating in the name of uncertainty as opposed to risk, that philosophically speaking, no one can tell you, not even someone with all the information in the world. That's a, that is at variance with what the rest of the world will tell you about business ideas, which is that there's some person who's like an old guy like me, and you come to me and tell me about your business idea, and then I wax at the sock about all the ways that it won't work, but then you really leave because then you don't have to do anything and you can go back to your desk job. Right? Like, you do. Right? Like, that is just not how the world works. The world is a world in which um, these opportunities do not exist outside of you. They are a combination of external forces and internal creativity, and they get generated or discovered in the mind of the entrepreneur. And that has some very interesting implications for how you teach entrepreneurship, and that is one of the main posts out of the class. Um, so, seven out of every ten ventures fail, I would argue, because most people don't understand what they're actually doing when they're engaging in the process of building and making business. Startups are not miniaturized, shrunk down dollhouse companies. That is not what they are. Like they don't operate with the same physics that a large company operates, or an established company operates. Um, I'm making a case, actually, that startups are something different. They're actually social systems, not organizations, that are engaged in the search process. And what are they searching for? They're searching for a durable business model. And they're doing so under conditions of uncertainty, parenthetically, not. And I think that's a fair assessment of where we got last. So, two other reasons that I'm going to propose why the eventual failure rate is so high is something really straightforward, which is that it's actually really difficult to conduct these experiments and learn. It's hard to learn, and it's hard to learn fast enough. So you end up not learning quickly enough before you either run out of money or attention. And then the third issue is um, the more novel, and actually even more uh, bad news. What bad news specifically that having some discovery process that you use to evaluate businesses 
it's only as powerful as your ability to execute against that process. Right? What I'm trying to say is simply stated, most people are not capable of doing work. Right? They can't manage their way out of a wet paper bag. And telling them that they can't do that makes them angry. Parenthetically, they're right? unwilling. And so talking about that is really bad. Now, the reason that you'll notice these two things make a terrible book. Last week we showed a lot of different books, right? The Lean Startups, like the Business Model of Canvas, and the Lean Startup Manual. Those are great books, right? And the reason they're great is because they tell a really awesome story that you can, well, actually, tell the great story first. You're dumb, and if you just read this book, you'll be really smart because knowledge totally makes the difference. Right, the more knowledge you have, knowledge is good. Yeah, totally. Right, always. Right, and that's the problem. Right, that if you have a book that will really help, and then the problem, the reason the startups fail, is because of lack of product market fit. Translation: It's not your fault. So my book for why startups fail is a really terrible. Book, right, it has two chapters. One, you're not capable of learning somehow. Right, your social system is broken, so you can't learn fast enough. And Fail, or you're just incompetent. I mean, these are extreme, I'm giving you extreme shorthand. But you understand, these two messages are no fun. No one likes these messages. Because then you can't go to the entrepreneur cocktail party and explain that your business failed because, I mean, do you ever go anywhere where people are like, yeah, my startup totally blew up and it was because like of lack of product market fit? No one's like, oh yeah, my startup blew up because like, I'm a really bad manager and as soon as I had two people to manage, I totally failed the development process and we fell over in a heap. I made a terrible strategic decision because I outsourced like three to three Pakistani dudes who run up and took all my code and I lost my money. No one's told that story. <laughs> that's, a, that's not an interesting story. Right? So I'm making a, a strong claim like, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probe this super hard over the course of 10 weeks. Like, this is why I think the adventures fail. Although product market fit is important, I'm not arguing that it's not. I'm simply saying that's a totally over socialized perspective on why new venture failure rate is so high. And for those of you who did ask me, what is my circumstantial evidence for why this is the case? That's, that's yes, thank you. That's true. That is one answer is the foundry. The foundry is my experimental proof that the school of business is not the case. Yeah. What you're talking about the other one where all these things like white combinator and no matter where they go, they're still, I mean, they still feel like they're still happy. Yeah. So, what, and thank you for that. So, what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to communicate, bring all of you up to speed conversationally about where we got last week, is that, like, this stuff is crazy talk. Like, the idea that we're going to suspend the venture failure rate and that, like, the venture fail because of some other problem, like, that all sounds really crazy. I mean, one, major piece of circumstantial evidence that this is the case, which is this issue of the accelerators, which is, if it were true, accelerators are the place where lean startup activity happens. Right? And it's the place where the best and most promising companies go through into those places. And despite all of that effort, despite all the accelerators, despite all the curriculum, despite all the good deals that go into them, and despite all the support and calories and effort by mentors, um, the startup failure rate inside accelerators is either exactly the new venture failure rate or worse in most cases. So what, I'm arguing, what I argued for last week was treatment of that. Right? For those of you who are biomedical folks, do I have any biology here? No, you're a Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so like, so the issue I'm trying, I'm getting at here is treatment effect. It's like a cancer, a cancer drug, right? So I have this claim that I'm going to be able to solve cancer. So I take an untreated population, right, of individuals who have like a, a nasty cancer, right, and then I have a treated population of individuals who I've given my drug. And in the case of startups, right, the thing is, is that given the drug made no difference. So what do you what do you conclude? What's the treatment effect? Zip. So if all this lean startup stuff really worked. How come it's not moving the needle around the small business failure rate? Well, I don't have to answer that problem because I don't write the books, right? I'm not into, I'm not the author who makes his living selling the book about when he started, so it's not my problem. I just know it's going to be the problem. And you say, I like the last thing you said, um, you listening and I'm sure it's pretty good to talk about. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the main points in the last thing that really said that. So I should have just like gave him the, the topic of view and you would have done that. Just, yeah. 
write that down in your notes. Like deep risking and uncertain thing doesn't help dot 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 much. It helps, but it doesn't help much. So that's what we're trying to get at conversation. Is there anything that you guys remember from last week that like got I I've underemphasized here that you thought that was really important that we covered? Yeah. To me the biggest thing that stood out is um, it's kind of pushing care aside. It's more the unknown yeah. that you cover rather than being fearful of certain things which it doesn't mean. Yeah. So said another way, if if it's the case that you're in the business of creatively disclosing through experimentation a business that has yet to be invented, the most important thing you have to worry about is barriers to action. Right? That's the focus of the class, is reducing the barrier to action. And when we actually got down to talking about it, there are only a few things that prevent us from acting. Frankly, one of them is just fear. Right? Fear of being uh, wrong, fear of wasting your time, fear of being embarrassed, fear of failure, all those sorts of stuff. So the sooner you can get over those sorts of things, actually you can move forward. Other, other thoughts about stuff that is under That's a, that's a great question. I actually don't know. My assumption is no, but I've never bothered to look. And that'll be really fun to find out. That's knowable. And it'll be another country in growing if it turns out that the successes are smaller, for example. Thank you. is, okay, great, so a new venture is a, a small group of individuals, one, two, three, and a social system engaged in the process of searching for a durable business. Great, I got that. So what specifically then is the business model that these teams are searching for so that you know how to find it? So for those of you who got a chance to look at the uh, uh, pre-lecture and the slides, can we quickly get ourselves uh, get all of us up to speed on what a business model is or how to think about it. Yeah. We need to talk about it. So there's some component of that around the business model is the value proposition. But that's directly from the strategy class, right? Yeah. Yeah, of course, right? So you're just, you're reading, you're like, okay, I didn't really look at the material or the slides. Let me dig into my life, but I'm only making fun of you a little bit. Right? It's like, okay, so what, let's go back and what, what can you find in the closet of like terms that like are important? Oh, and appropriately, right? You need to be able to figure out whatever value proposition means. I'm not quite sure what that is, but clearly it's important. Cool. So I'm with you. Or a startup that gets a economic justification for Okay, so that's, actually, that's really precise and very useful. So, so you're suggesting a business model is the underlying economic justification for the business to exist. Yeah. I was reading when I thought I understood the research. Yep. Which is that uh, you know, an ideal is only the same that they can uh, support itself. That's right. That's what so you can imagine, by the way, inventing a series of venture concepts or ideas, screening them, testing them, and evolving a underlying business model that um, demonstrates <coughs> conclusively that the thing that you're envisioning is not a standalone business, but it's actually a feature inside another company. That's a completely reasonable outcome, right? But in order for it, but in, and so that's one state of affairs. Right, this experimental process that we're going to engage in, there's several outcomes that can emerge from this. Outcome A, you discover through experimentation a fatal flaw in the business. So you, you reject the business. You discover through experimentation that the, and you find a business that you don't want to build. You can imagine that. You, you can either find a, for example, you find a restaurant, you discover in the process of building it, but no one wants your home cooked country comfort food, but they really want um, I don't know, sushi. sushi. And you're like, you know what, I don't want to do a sushi restaurant. Okay. That's exactly right. You can imagine that city. 
You can manage the tertiary state of affairs, which is you disclose a business that turns out to not be a standalone business. That is the target for acquisition, or a company to be built into another company. Right? That's what happens. Or, ideally, you disclose a business that is that is has its own economic right to survive. So now we're going to look at the business. Now, now we're going to zoom in for a minute, just like on Google Maps. We're now zooming in on the businesses that have earned the economic right to survive. And there you have really two basic outcomes. First, the application of that capital will cause that business to scale, in which case you have a venture-backed business. Or the application of capital does not cause that business to scale, and you have a small business. It's following the underlying logic. And all that can be found in the slides. And there's also a series of, if you look at the series of videos connected to the slides, you'll hear all manner of people talking about all manner of businesses that they've discovered with all manners of outcomes. That's an important feature from the material, right? The business model doesn't necessarily, building a business model doesn't necessarily mean you can build a business that's durable, but your intent, right, is to find a business that is not productive. So, I got some of you back. And this is what I wanted to get at. So, and this really helps to introduce, begin to introduce our speaker. Because I'd like you to consider a couple things as you're experimenting through the business model. Right? Is that the first piece of your business model is a story. Right? The first time you tell a story about your business, right? you're telling a story about its right to it survive. Reason to exist. At first, it's a narrative it's told in text or in conversation with other people. I can't tell you the number of times that I basically, when people talk about writing down the business on a napkin, what they're describing is this process, which is that I talk story back and forth with you. In the process of telling the story, we imagine and can sketch out a business that has some sense that we can work with, that we can work with. And then that business moves from this continuum where it's a story, language between the two of us, to text on a piece of paper, to more text on more pieces of paper, to maybe eventually to a spreadsheet, test results, dashboards, sometimes even performance, but only a day. Right? Performance being the image Right, so as you engage in the experimental process, you move from narrative to numbers. The other important thing to understand about those two things is as you move from narrative to numbers, when you look, this is a little kicker with the business plan, right? You guys have all seen business plans. At the beginning, they have like words in them, and at the back, they have like spreadsheets. What's the trick about these two things? Always go to the back. What's that? People always go to the back first. So I always go to the back first, right? <laughs> I look at the numbers, and then I read the words. And what, what am I looking for? All I want to know, these things are the same. It's just words are numbers. They're the same freaking thing. There's no difference. That's a business plan. A business plan is a story frozen in time where the pieces of paper that represent the spreadsheet and the narrative that you have to get around your business are the same. Now, tomorrow, this will be different, right? No one expects this to be the same. But understanding the process, understanding what you're doing, helps you grapple with the essential essence of this activity, which is don't worry about the numbers first. Get the narrative right. If you have a great narrative, things will sort themselves out. I just tear this up. <laughs> Here's where things get interesting. Remember when I told you in my lecture that all businesses basically do the same thing? And I sort of said that like all businesses are a function of the same value chain to produce something, to sell what you produce. And for those of you who are familiar with the wire, my favorite <laughs> drug dealing, drug dealer proposition Joe, right? All business like if you're proposition Joe, all, all entrepreneurship is the same, right? You buy for a dollar, you sell for two dollars. It doesn't really matter what it is, right? It could be crack the game, it could be rival application. The whole point is that part of the economic to survive is you have to build something, you have to produce it, and when you value all the inputs, you have to make sure that those inputs are less than the cost of time. Right, 
Um, let me double this. Yeah. So here now, and I'm not going to. We're going to talk about. I think my, I'm going to propose we talk about our own venture ideas over dinner. So for those of you who missed last week, after class is done, we all kind of roll the stone ground and take that physics long, like kind of kings of the round table, like King Arthur section with a super long table. You just inhabit it between the top. So you can share your business ideas there if you want. So this is who I want to zero in on tonight. This is we tend to forget that we accept the fact that physical technology is advanced. Mm -hmm. Spend any time in your tech strategy class, what do you learn about technology? It's pretty amazing. It always like and there's always some like guy who does tech strategy classes or like these curves. It always will happen to the left. In fact, every business chart always goes up into the right. Always goes up to the right. This technology is always evolved, and that's exciting. Right. And um, what's important to that in this class is that ways of creating value, business models, and modes of organizing also value, also change. So what we sort of know this thing Base technical advance happens all the time. We have a sense that as base technical advance is occurring, that alters how we choose to organize to create value. A simple example is, in my world, software engineering. The way we organize to produce software nowadays is different than the way we organize to produce software a decade ago. And that's largely due to changes in programming languages, it's due to changes in the underlying speed of the computers is due to what other technical advantages are changing. Yeah, another there's learning, but there's learning effects as well. Right? All this stuff is going to change how you organize your firm to generate value. So these two things right, are, should be unsurprising. If you've taken a tech strategy class, or you've taken a strategy class, or you class, you should say, okay, I sort of get what you're saying. Advances in technology are going to influence modes of organizing. Probably modes of organizing influences the technologies, and there's some complicated feedback. But the bottom line is, that. what I'm saying is that these things change too. And this is the hopeful message for this evening. Why is the hopeful message for this evening? Because not all of us are um, in touch with basic scientific technologies. Not all of us are. Not on the, we're not going to be leading energy of research, so I'm not going to be able to be doing the interesting thing. But this is everyone, especially crafty MBAs, like this is your wheelhouse, is figuring this stuff out. As it turns out, innovating in the business model space is what a lot of interesting people are like to do And I think I gave I think, three examples of this. There's Microsoft in the videos, there is Janice Roberts. Has anyone watched the economics of three? Okay, so someone, if you wouldn't mind, someone summing up the economics of free video for the class, so we can move, we can have that in, in the room with the dam. I want to give an example to explain that which she, she talked about it towards the end. Some games now are being given for free, but the content itself becomes all the game, do everything for free, and then within the game, you can start buying upgrades, what would she call, we're selling nothing. Well, from upgrade uh, from electron so, sound. Yeah, so, so, so you're selling electrons inside you're the recycled, you're selling the recycled electrons, but, but people they value that because it adds to the experience, and that's effectively a premium model. You can play it for free, but yet you get better or get more value of the service, you can start buying stuff, you know, with that. And, and there are some, some online services now where they provide you and buy. That's number one now. I, it's a bad example. Yeah, with email now, you can still, it's a premium, but you can still upgrade or buy things within it to make it better. So, that's a useful example. So, what I'm, what I'm trying to get around this issue of how you create value is for your venture concept that you have. So, consider. Also, 
really have to really want something. You almost have to offer something free to just get a on whatever it may be. Because it's really kind of So all of this, this is super helpful to get at what I'm trying to get at for you to walk in. Is that our traditional strategy world tells us that the only options that you have for business models exist in the strategy version. But that's the basic trajectory. That the goal is to create advantage, that there are very clear, known ways from quarter, if you guys remember my quarter from your classes, in the strategy class, that this is a known space and you can go to that. And what I'm suggesting is that entrepreneurs have the opportunity and the privilege to actually go beyond quarter to engage in clever hacks to existing business models and in so doing, find new ways to create value that have never been conceived of before. And that is a cool thing. Like this, this is the heavy part of it. And this is where we just need this more conversation with the better gift value. Right? Because it's important to not confuse the visible chunk of a business with the mechanism that it uses to make money. And this has never been more true than today. Right? So most web-based businesses are a game of sleight of hand in which we offer you something for free. The visible part of the business is user-generated content at Facebook. The underlying model for the business is aggregating and selling that data off with the advertisers. But in the case of, for example, Twitter, they're simply selling this thing called the fire hose, which is merely this tweet stream. Who buys it? Lots of market research companies buy it. So the point is, in a world where you can begin to decouple the visible chunk of the business from how you create value, you have a very interesting role to play for you guys. And for me too, it's really exciting. So two points under that that I want to really emphasize. The first is, it's my belief that most of the business model insights around this the ability to decouple the visible part of the business and the underlying economic logic of the business. A lot of that stuff kind of got invented uh, during the internet boom. And so we tend to view the, this process as something that only happens with, with digital goods. And what I'm going to argue is that very soon, this will be though as physical goods at, at, at will. And you'll be buying or actually you'll be receiving all sorts of goods. Clothing, shoes, watches, skateboards, physical objects of all type. We'll be getting more and more of these for free to the end user because the businesses will be figuring out how to make other money on the back. That is the most interesting place to play right now. I actually find super creative and I often use uh, the example yeah, some pop up I've been challenging every every undergraduate class with this exercise, which is um, imagine for whatever venture concept that you have currently conceived of, the ones that are in your EI business ideas list. Simply tonight, as you're talking to people or thinking about them or evaluating them, imagine what would happen or how you'd be created to simply give away the customer-facing part of what you're doing for free and figuring out how to make money some other way. Now, of course, that's crazy. Um, but inevitably, you can do the bike shop challenge, and unfortunately, Phil's not here tonight. He's one of the recent undergraduate students. He's been tracking this particular problem for three years. In 2009, it wasn't possible to imagine, even with a leasing model, or a cell phone subscription model, or an ad based model, to figure out how to sell free bikes. As of last year, he found a way to get bikes from Taiwan, commuter bikes from Taiwan, for $20 a piece. Right? And he has a model now, theoretically, where he could actually go out at Walmart and give away bikes. Just open a bike shop where the bikes are free. And you can make money on service and accessories and a bunch of other stuff. Now, I'm not suggesting you go to a bike shop. I'm sure if you sat down for 15 minutes, you could tease apart 800 reasons why Bill's bike free bike shop idea won't work. The point isn't Bill's bike shop idea. The point is your business idea. And the point is getting creative and interesting and clever and sassy about how your business could take advantage of this really interesting ability, which is simply to decouple the 
visible manifestation of the business from its underlying economic logic. When you do that, you move into a position where you can completely mix and match. And that's what you're saying. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Right? That, um, yeah. But here's the problem. So what I talked about in my in the lecture, so here now we're moving, we're moving beyond the slide, we're moving beyond what I what I kind of is there is amazingly an entire literature that we just need to learn from. Are we going to talk about the underlying business model? Should I not reveal it? Do you have any idea what I can talk about? Do you have any feel of how how that Okay, so I'm going to talk about that. What I'm going to tell you is I encourage you to listen to Dan and, this is Dan and Jessica. They're both from Reddit. Yes, you guys are the founders. You guys are now part of that group. It's all the same now. Um, and we're going to listen and have a dialogue and answer that about. How that this came to be. And why I think it's great that they came in tonight is because Reddit gifts did not come to be because someone it's someone came through and came up with a venture concept and experimented their way to a business model. Like I'm lying, basically. Everything I'm telling you about how we're gonna do stuff is a lie. And I lie all the time too. This is an interesting uh, business because it is a business and because it shouldn't be. By any measure of the things that we've been learning about in our fancy MBA program, the fact that these two have generated value and the way that they generated value is simply not conceivable. It's not part of the world. It's not how the world works. What I'm going to suggest that we actually enter a conversation in the way that we suspended in week one our belief about the fact that seven out of three ten businesses fail as natural law. Dan is actually, Jan Jessica, are going to force us to grapple with dropping a whole set of assumptions about how customers behave, about how companies get built, and about how value gets created. And I think this setup will help you be able to interpret what they're saying so you don't hear them as crazy. The danger is when hearing what they're saying is mercurial or not possible, or only possible for a short period of time. And what I'm going to suggest is this is actually more normal than you would imagine. So with that, we're going to come to chat. It'll just be me. Okay. So Jessica's here if anybody has a question. You guys, I found out you have to get the physical because they're not the physical model. Right, so the physical model is each other. Another model. Another model. Another model. How did the pre-lecture and slides work? Was that I just did a, this is my first time through taking slides that I would be talk, talking over and just giving them to you and doing a pre-lecture and then building on them to talk about something else. Did that did that work? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. So I'm gonna so it's okay. Can we try that again next week and, and I'll try to we'll see if it gets better. Right, so next week we'll talk, we'll do the same basic principles as I'll preload the lecture, I'll provide the slides. And we'll have an amplified discussion about it. Okay. Oh, cool. So, I'm going to talk about this. So, I'm just going to go through quickly some of my background so you guys have a little context about how this came up, why it came up, and how we got here. So, I started, I'm an engineer, I'm a programmer, and I started doing that in the mid 90s. And I actually got out of college and uh, started my program. Um, 20 years ago, the job of the program that I was stuck in the area of life. So I went through a whole bunch of startups. I worked for magazines, I worked for a company that transcribes taxes, I worked for a supply chain management company, I worked for uh, advertising. 
advertising companies. Um, and what I kind of found was that the beginning of a startup is super exciting. So I was always at point one, and point two, and point three, something like that. And it's amazing. It's super fun. It's a social thing. You get really excited about it, regardless of the idea. The idea could be the most stupid thing in the world. But somebody gave me a couple million dollars to drop and build a company to transcribe the back to and, uh, and you bond with these like five or ten people do it. The problem happens when, um, at least the problem happens for me in all of these companies where six months, a year, two years down the road, that kind of like bonding with these five or ten people, so that 30 people, and it's no longer really fun. And you don't really care about transcribing the fact. It's not very exciting. So you move on to your next game and you work your way up. And uh, so that was kind of my career, and that's how it was going. And I did uh, multiple startups on the side as I'm working in this company. And uh, four, about four and a half years ago, somebody introduced me to Reddit.com as a way to come out of a startup that I was working on. Um, and I became a very casual user of Reddit. You guys continue to your Reddit. That's good. You'll all be coming out So, Reddit is big. Reddit has become very big. 55 million community visitors and 450 billion pages last month. So, that's good. Reddit has 22 employees. I don't know if you are familiar with that company, but that's unfair. Like, nobody does that. Nobody has that many employees in that big way. So I was introduced to Reddit and I started promoting uh, my personal <coughs> through that. And one day I came across a post that kind of took me off guard and got me interested in the community more than the community that I was able to promote. So this guy had this idea. And his idea was so Jeff Blue is offering this promotion where for six hundred dollars you can buy an all you can fly past for thirty. You can fly anywhere that Jeff Blue goes 30 days, and as long as you don't miss on your flight, you can keep going. So, this guy's idea was why don't we try and raise some money as a community and send some regular off on what it is that we plan for them, doing things that we tell them to do. For some reason, this was like really exciting. So, I got involved and started talking to him, and we were one of the very first Kickstarter. So, uh, you know, the numbers aren't huge, but we ended up raising like $2,000, and we were able to send two people on this vacation. And the two people went to like 15 places, and um, this all happened in the span of like a week. So like, we were able to like raise money, we were able to get these two guys to go on this trip. They were unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> and they like, they came to our house and like, we fed them brain burrito, it was like, it's really fun. Um, and then they flew all over and uh, took a picture of it. It was just a really interesting way to see like um, this, this community that was, you know, in various islands, but it was like Reddit community, which does like, was known probably like a weird thing, but they like, came together to do something interesting. That was like my introduction to the Reddit community. And, and it ended up, it ended up really like changing, changing my life, changing my life. So a couple months later, like a month later, I was working from my house and I had this idea. Um, like 8.30, 9 in the morning, I had this idea. And, um, what would it be like if you did a secret Santa on the internet? I know, so, and I didn't put much more thought into it. Like that was, that was about, I put like three minutes of thought into it. And I said, okay, it gets you out of the like about 15 dollars. Uh, we have had a deadline for when the stuff is exchanged, and um, you guys call us what you should be doing. That was my idea, and then I floated this idea with that red community on November 10, 2009. And um, surprisingly, within you know, a couple minutes, there was a couple hundred comments that people were discussing this project before really happened. But I haven't played any more projects. 
So after a day or a half a day, we came up with these basic rules, which would end up kind of like shaping the next three years of our community. And uh, the rules are pretty simple. If you don't plan on sending a gift, don't send it. If you work on autism, add to the set there's a lot of that um, Don't be a jerk, please. And the suggested value. So, this was, there are no into November, this is November 10th. We came up with these rules. And I kind of realized that we might be actually a little bit ready in the season to kind of get more things if we want this to arrive at the center. Um, thinking this through, this is something that um, we can't manage on the Excel spreadsheet. There's so many people, there's thousands of people. And luckily, I'm a programmer, so I said, well, I can write the software, so why don't I just start doing it? So, November 15, five days later, we put together a survey that was able to handle the traffic of the And we launched this, the very first version. And the website was pretty simple. It did exactly what it needed to do on that day, and nothing else. It did a little bit of promotion. It showed statistics of who had signed up so that people could be decided and sign up. And it allowed them to sign up. That was it. That's all it did. But in four days, you know, that, was, uh, that was a pretty good piece, especially while I had full time job. Um, so we launched that. and. We ended up getting, you know, 4,400 people in 62 countries signed up. Uh, we didn't really know what that meant. We knew that was a lot. Um, and, you know, we didn't know if it was going to work. Uh, a lot of these people were scared that, like, when you change the names, this is basically like the change the names of the pad. Everybody puts their name in and the pad out and that's what you're going to Everybody was scared that they would come all pull out my name. <laughs> but we didn't do that. So, um, so it was really exciting. You know, this is a lot of people in a lot of countries putting their faith and their home attitudes um, on a website built by some people that they had never heard of. So, um, the system that we created, um, let me just take a step back. How, how this process works, all the things that we So you sign up, sign ups are, they can be over two or three weeks. And then when sign ups are over, we run a process that we call net, which is basically creating a daily chain for everybody who would sign up. So I give to you, you give to you, you give to me. But we don't ever like give to each other. So um, if I send you something back, you don't know that I send you something back. Um, so once, once that goes out, you have about two weeks to stop your person and you can actually figure out what the perfect gift for them is. Come back to our website and tell us that you ship a gift. When you ship a gift, we tell you, we ask you to tell us how much the gift costs, how much you spend on shipping. That's optional, you don't have to. Um, and then when you receive a gift, hopefully you can come back to our website and we post it to the what else you say. So, you know, between November 15th, we use the database from here actually to Facebook or to Facebook. We took a vacation and spent the entire vacation doing the Because the bulk of the website is here. So there's a lot of numbers, a lot of technology involved in this, confirming, there's tons of emails that we have to send out to remind people that you have to do this and that and that and remind you of a lot of things. So the day comes, matching goes out, and the first gift. And we didn't know this was going to work. This is really exciting. And the first gift that ever posted was a steam gift. It was this one buck. I'm not really a fan of it. People were excited and they saw that it actually worked. And this was pretty cool. But then something kind of like really made it happen. This to me really fun to be here by the way. Yes. So this person posts a gift. And I remember the same person. And the gift was my package. So somebody had like somebody had went and bought a shark, had cut it open, and stuffed it full of the gifts that were for the 
Then this person puts together a photo on the topic that can be inserted in the something really special going on. We still weren't quite sure if it was going to continue, if this was true. But knowing Reddit, Reddit does a lot of crazy things and a lot of really, really super inspiring things. And this was just one of those things. This was somebody who was well off, who was matched to a college student who was broke, and sent him $1,500 in cash. <laughs> somebody But there was a 96% shipper. So 96% of the people who signed up, 43, 4,400 people, actually shipped the gift to a stranger. And I think that the median gift here was somewhere around $30. So we recommend $15 to make up. So that was the life cycle. Should we do this again? Now, this is a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. It made a lot of people happy. We weren't making money, making money on it, but we weren't trying to make money at all. In fact, we were, we were saying that we weren't trying to make money. There was no problem for that. So, after a great story and a whole bunch of fun, we decided that we were going to do it again. And what we wanted to do is we wanted, we wanted to try and prove it that we could have the same feeling behind it of that it that wasn't at Christmas time. So there was a lot of people who participated in this way. It was <clears throat> a lot of people. Different religions, different countries. But but we still weren't sure like how much of a role did the holidays, did the Christmas holidays play in that So we proposed a question to the Red community and said, um, we're gonna have a new holiday on June twenty fifth after <laughs> And it's going to be a red card, what should we call it? And give that to you. Arbitrary. So, <laughs> it's for it's arbitrary. It's arbitrary. It's not arbitrary, though. It's going to be happening on the same day every year. But it's called arbitrary. So, 
we went back in and we divided all the software. In, in a rush, we had not many software that could support more than one So we relaunched all the software, we relaunched the website, and that arbitrator was a little smaller than CD2. But it was still good. Almost 4,000 people. But we still didn't know if people were going to People are still going to use the system. People are going to So, you know, people took a while and they, this person didn't want to get day one, the person matched one, they have to send it in, they were matched. So they get two deals. That was pretty good. The person got a PS3. Wow. And a whole bunch of books. And shoes. No shoes. <laughs> um, money. <clears throat> so, it didn't have the 96% success rate, but the 92% success rate was. Probably 13% better than my best case scenario. A lot of money spent. So it worked. You know, we looked back on this and, and uh, we reflected on what we did, and we could say that, that we were able to duplicate a secret sale. Um, so, Secret Santa 2010 rolled around, and we made that to the end. 17,000 people in our secret sale. This was still in the best way. And, <laughs> and uh, my career was, was uh, more intense. I left my job and I got on to work at a nonprofit, uh, nonprofit teaching company. And this was a startup. I was employed number one there. And we were trying to build that and doing this at the same time. It's a weird thing when you were getting more press than the startup was trying to get press than the work for. <laughs> and it's really hard to try and explain to your CEO oh, and why you're on the news, not for this company. So this was a lot of people. Um, and to be honest, I think the right perspective was almost more than, than we had. It was a lot. But, but it was incredible. You know, this,
But we didn't look at streaming. And I'm not going to go through all the other streams that we have. Because we have a lot. But this was the first one. And it was bigger than the original institution. And it had 94% of the growth. $100,000 worth of streaming. We were selling to each other. People still like streaming. So that was great. So while we were doing this, I got an email from the advanced publications who are on the And we entered into conversations with them. And uh, we did arbitrary day, in which Jimmy Don participated in. Uh, and he was really good. And then Reddit announced that they had acquired us. So we gave him to do this full time now. This was a big thing for us. This was us. We had given a lot of our time and a lot of our hard work. The project to make people happy. That was what we did. And this was Reddit saying, we want you to continue doing it, and we want to pay you, and we want you to make it better. And you're going to work from home, you're going to do your work from your own office, which is what I'm talking about. You work from your own office, and we're going to leave you on your own to do what you do. So, so we did. We opened a lot of doors for us. Uh, the, the first door that we opened was to Guinness World Records, who would never pay attention to it before. But when I could call and say, we were just talking to us, they took the call. And worked with us to set up a new world record category. So we have done, we doubled the amount of participants in 2011, all 40,000 people in 118 countries. That's a lot of money. But I'm always amazed at where. Or like, there's four people up here. Like that's crazy. Seventy-two people there. <laughs> oh, so it was huge. Like this is double. So we're on two next growth. People send me three. You guys should totally sign up for Super Sam next week. <laughs> So we've gone through this process. We have established a community. We have proven that people are willing to send absolute strangers. Thanks for a better than they did the And that this thing is going to grow. And we can do it. So then we have this idea that we want to do a better job. What we want to do is we want to take our stream concept and eliminate the receiving part of it. So you send somebody something, but you don't get anything. But it's a one on one connection you're having with So Stephen Colbecker, I've got that particular. <laughs> Stephen Colbert uh, helped us promote this idea in a Redditors would sign up to give a troop a pair package. And troops would sign up to receive a pair package. It's kind of like, it's a sexy idea, but it's our first pair of So we had over 3,000 Redditors sign up to give a pair packages, but only 450 of them to sign up to give And only 76% really hard to get to a truth as well. And it's really hard to get the truth to sign up to receive the care package. It's really hard to let them know that they should sign up. So this is one of our this is one of our biggest failures, but that's okay. Because what we have done is we have written the software that was required to do this new type of charity. So I actually have a teacher friend who lives up north. And she teaches the value. And she emailed me after this. And she said, you know what you guys should do? You guys should do what the Arnold Institute does, but then it's something you can just send to teachers and switch them up that they need. Tell us what they need. So we did that just for teachers. So they would use the software that we've done. But it totally worked. You know, we sent $127,000 of school supplies to teachers. 
And I'm way more proud of this than I am of the senior exam stuff. The teachers were hard to rest in the middle of because teachers aren't that awesome at the internet. But it totally worked. You know, it, it, it was hard. The hardest part about it was trying to get the right amount of givers and the right amount of receivers. So we would have to on that. We would have to We need 10 more givers. We need 10 more teachers. But we did that pretty quick. And you know, nearly $40 in the But it's totally worth it. And, and it made a lot of fun. You know, I'm going to make a tweet with you guys when I'm done talking about this. But you know, it made a lot of fun. And it helped a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us up to the current situation. And almost 60,000 people in 127. This one's super group. I don't know that that number was like 70 people. This one's group. I think it's four of four. <laughs> but that number is really good. And the kids were still awesome. People love to send gifts to kids that people put on their profile and they have children. People are always sending children. 1.5 million dollars. 440,000 dollars. I keep telling my salespeople over there that we can do a deal with my kids. We have to do that. So we do that. Because we put them in an awful lot of money. So that brings us up to, to now. And I know Rob will move into our business plan. And you've got a good business student, so you probably will come in. Like, where is your business? Well, we were lucky that we had a couple of years where we didn't focus on business at all. I had some ideas, I had some concepts. I didn't have the time to test them out. But I didn't have the time to build it. And we built this community on Reddit, yes, but it's its own community. We have our own group doing our own thing. And we didn't have to focus on that. But last year we decided that we decided with, with Reddit, we were going to start figuring out how we were going to We haven't figured it all out yet, but I know we can get some things done, and I know that we're on the right track. So, What I don't want to do is I don't want to implement a business plan that is going to hurt our community or affect the community in any way. Because what we do is special. It's altruistic. It strengthens the Reddit community. Uh, it strengthens participants. It makes the world a better place. So I don't want to do anything to hurt that. But we still need to become self sustainable. So what we did is we wrote all the software last year and we launched for, for Christmas time a very, very early day about the Reddit marketplace, which is where merchants, small or big, get invited by us and have their products sold in our market. And what we do is we facilitate the purchase process of one or more merchants' products in one purchase process for our new person. Or figure it out. And, and the test work. So we only had about 20 active merchants, so we generated a couple hundred thousand dollars of the So people trusted us, people would put their credit card number into our site, people would spend money with us, the merchants were happy. So what we're going to do throughout this year, at least this is the plan, this is the plan is that we want to enable anybody in the world to send a gift to anybody in the world without using their address. And we're going to start on Reddit. There's a weird thing that happens on Reddit where people buy stuff from people on Reddit. So we want, if somebody makes a comment on Reddit or somebody 
So that's what we do. This year we're going to have 50 gift exchanges. Um, we have six exchanges going on right now. We've got books, snacks, Pokemon, and socks. So when I, you know, when I do now the last six years of the power of red, I don't have anything to do with my own about my active duty you know. But I but I emailed him and I just said, look, I'm gonna move on. I need a business program. I do that to you. He is a business people, not not technical people. You know, you gotta figure out how to become a learning tool. That's a hard thing to do. And to be honest, in in 15 years, I hadn't had a business co-founder that I wanted to work with in um, So if you can learn how to appeal to a millionaire, you can find a business and do a lot of So I emailed Alexis and I, you know, I just said, I'm ready to move on if you know anybody. And, um, and he emailed back and said, uh, I'm going to introduce you to someone. And I think like a week later, I got an email to see if this person was going to get the public Is that still a question side? So I got an email from, from New York, and then they flew out to San Francisco, and we had meetings. This process went on for like, like four months, six months, something like that. This application process I think it was just really. But that was the story of the thing. What is the value of the software? There would be many of you. So there is a, there's a bunch of communities that have sprung up on Reddit as a result of what we did. Uh, purely because we don't have the, the capacity to facilitate the exchange of the one. And they do their own exchanges on Reddit. And it works okay because they're so small. It's just like two people exchanging with them. But at this scale, you know, we have even like 4,000 people managing this process. And you know, a lot of a lot of the hard work that the software has to do is figure out how to remind people to participate. And I don't think that I study What we have is this really long conversion form. And it's the hardest thing to do. And it can technically and you know, not technically at this point do it takes a lot. It's hard to get somebody to sign up for something and follow through to you know with like 10 steps in between. Really, really hard. So what we've done and you know, what people are constant about is figuring out the best way to remind people. To um, so I don't know. I mean, what's the technical value? I don't know. I mean, we would never have had this would have never happened if I wasn't uh, And this would have, you know, the, the difference. The difference here is that what we do we care about. We create it and we create it non not for profit. So the hard times that we've been put through as a result of that every business goes through, uh, which, which are contracts, uh, which is like management. 
material stuff and writing it or you know, users just being vicious to us. Those things are all made up. And you know, that's the difference between this and all of the other startups that I know. Is that you know, I think that why I care so much, and, and I think about this a lot, trying to figure out why I care so much about what I do. I think it's because it's making the world you know, a little bit happy. It's making people happy. It's done good things for people. I think that's why. I don't think I would have the same feeling if I had thought this exactly so much. I would talk to you Yeah, so we do. And what we find is that the average number of exchanges for participants is three. The most people participate in three exchanges. But we've got a lot of new users. You know, we have new exchanges. We get a lot of new users for each different type of exchange that we do. You know, parking monitoring by different people. I make up the data on the exchange last year about a new type of people. What we're trying to figure out is just you know, you know, if, if, if people decide to make up their own policy from that piece of the so That's you know, what, I, what I'm going to say. There's really just a ton of money available in this like, happening. People have a lot of money. And if we can provide them a mechanism to, to give us that money, they will actually give us that money. So we can get people in my door. Did it cost you to hold the server? And you say, and what do you think of the chat? So, uh, the website is written in the agenda, and my CEO has a database, and then patch for a gas uh, money store. And the servers early on uh, were, were my own for about the first month, and then a tech crunch article got posted, and they uh, used a couple other articles. And Reddit donated a server for us, which lasted one server. This is one server that has the website, the database, and the manufacturer. One server lasted us a year. It lasted us through our second season. It actually lasted us until we were in 
So that was a, that was a big I learned a lot technically from this process as well. Trying to fit um, trying to fit what you would normally help be hosted by a 20 server on one server at the peak audit hours is a bit more difficult. And, and uh, you know, it makes my technical decision that you can do that What are the qualifications for the preferred Bacon products? No, no. We're still figuring that out. Right? But what we want is uh, we want people who have quality products, people who have a track record of selling and doing customer service, people who are willing to buy the different experience, which is something we're going to be working on a lot in the next year. It's making sure that when you receive it, when you purchase your own marketplace, that it's, that it's a great receiving product. You're not feeling it yet. We've heard a few mumblings, but I think that what we've done pretty much stays out of the way of what people. I mean, they don't have to use the marketplace to participate in the exchange. We think that, that you know, we want to put together a great catalog of stuff where people would be happy to pay to do it. And, uh, and, I, and I think they understand. I would hope they understand that I'm not going out and asking for their which it's like you know, a long run to do for me in the long run, but I, but I think it's okay. I think that if, you know, we made the announcement that we were required, I think, you know, certain things to come along with that, certain expectations, at least for an adult. They would realize, okay, well, you know, the, the silver canal is going to figure out. Kind of, I mean, otherwise, if, if, you know, the alternative is we just die. Because we're growing, and we have an employee outside of us, we got salaries. Our tech staff is growing, so costs are more than our server now. We have 50 exchanges, which means a bunch of things. It means we have to pay artists every month to do art for our exchange, because that's how we can them efficiently. That's, that's what we're doing. So if we want to grow, which we do, right? you know, we just have to. Have to Figure out how to be self-sustainable. We can only, you know, we can only prove that we're strengthening red communities so much. You know, like at the end of the day, red, some of the red is going to look at their growth and not grow. But you know, in a sense, that today, the business that you're describing is going to be having to do the underlying technology that you built to allow for the social system to change and then moving to a pure core function. Go 
go out and find like the coolest stuff that, that everybody wants, and then they, they send traffic to their site, and they you know, make a commission on the sales. We tried that for a while. We have this benefit where we get free advertising on Reddit, and we have kind of a wealth of traffic on there as well, to play with. But it just didn't prove, it didn't prove worth the effort that it takes to create that kind of stuff. Whereas the marketplace is proven worth it. Uh, owning the customer, I mean, that sounds dirty, but I don't mean in a dirty way. But, um, owning that transaction and being able to ensure that that transaction is smooth, that it's a good, uh, that it's a good process for the end user, is, um, is in our best interest. And, but it's going to take a long time, right? We were just going to open up science to the wide place of any merchant computer. But that opens up a whole other world. All these problems where what, what we learned is what people like about the marketplace is they can come there and buy and do shit. Right? And, like, that's hard to do. You, you don't do that on Amazon. You search for books on Amazon and you don't uh, you know, So you have to search for an author. But basically, you know, what we want to provide happiness is, is great stuff for people. And I think we're doing a decent job of that. I don't know. I have to, you know, I have this saying that I've seen this a lot more recently, which is you always beg for forgiveness rather than ask for forgiveness. I am not. I have to be having any problems with that. Thank you. I was wondering that, dude. <laughs>
must be coming to the Doing startups in software world, you're going to come to a point where you're going to find somebody who's going to be programming for you. And probably you're not going to be able to get out of it, which is a hard sell. For somebody who can get out and make easy six figures with a 30 minute interview, which is what programmers do these days, it's a hard sell to approach somebody and get them to be someone for equity, right? Which one you never have in the job. I'm trying to think of, you know, like, this camera is the one who was on the first time that the last probably if we had a real one to get started with, as a business program. I'm trying to think of what you can't do. You can't do it all. But, you know, what you want to do is, like, you can talk about it. You can talk about it. And, and he, knows, he knows the words that I'm saying. He reads all the sorts of things that I need. And we can talk about things that he's saying there. Right? Like, when I talk to him, some, some, some decision that I think is stupid. He knows more about the money, which is good. Which is Definitely. That would be fun. Thank you. 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 Instrumentation because we just take it, it's just 
part of the underlying slide presentation. It's core to that business. We need to know whether the business is working or not is the instruments. There is no other thing to know other than how the business is working. There's a feeling, right? The classic kind of market reason for product market fit is how do you know when you find product market fit? Well, I, I know what it feels like when I don't have it, and I know what it feels like when I have it. You know what you need to do. Right? That's it. Right? That's, the, that's the, so there's that weird thing, which is like this feeling, and then there's these instruments. How do you manage in the process of this discovery, the activity in which you're going to be engaging, the feelings that you have about the fit of the business and what the instruments, uh, what the experimental results of the instruments are? How do you do that? How do you change the instruments? Uh, or do you change the instruments as you're tuning the business? One of the interesting things that happens with many businesses as they're experimenting is they continue to experiment a lot and continue to measure using the same instruments that they were measuring with a year ago, where the business doesn't exist anymore. That business is gone. They're working on an entirely different business, yet they're engaging with the same instruments that they were looking at previously. If I find out what the plan actually explains about service to give, he was even a success before that. He has no idea of making money. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in all of our venture ideas now, we have to talk about costs and make the money. Yeah. How good or bad is it to actually start with something with no idea? Yeah, so this is the, the third paradox I want to leave you with. Right? Thank you for bringing that one up. So here's this interesting paradox where we engage in this venture concept idea. Right? And here we have a counter case of everything that we just did last week. And get used to it. Right? I'm going to bring in people that basically kick over all of me. It's no fun for me to bring in people who agree with me. It's super boring. So I tend to bring in people that are either variants with what I'm saying or are off on the side. But here you have this scenario like, where the idea, you, know, you already know you're going to discover. You have to discover and wander around in the business. And here, you have absolutely no idea how we're going to be making money. What's up with that? Like, I'm not going to give you an answer because there is one. That's what I But this is an interesting puzzle, an interesting paradox. This is what makes the startup phenomenon, the adventure phenomenon, so interesting. And what makes it so physically, psychologically, and organizationally different from engaging in traditional strategy entrepreneurship. Not that there's anything wrong or bad about strategy entrepreneurship. Nor am I saying that nothing that you learn in strategy or tech strategy applies in the venture set. I'm merely making a very curious case that the underlying physics of a new venture are weird. They don't, gravity is different. And the sooner that we apprehend that, the better. So, here's my question. What, I mean, this has to be. Yes. This is, as a matter of fact, the scene of the teacher. I did not actually. This is what makes this interesting. This is why I want to share it with you. This, book. I, this is a t shirt. This is a sewn up t shirt with a small piece of underwear elastic. I really don't want to know where that came from. But it's true. And I got this in uh, Paris at a place you can go find on the internet called um, Bob's Juice Bar. Um, what's interesting about this thing is that this thing costs uh, 45 bucks. <laughs> they are incredibly hot in Paris. Um, meaning, not that it's hot in Paris, but these are very popular. If you go to any uh, trendy restaurant, Frenchy or Bob's Bar, or any places in the 17, any of the new school restaurateurs, rather than wearing chef's caps or other professional stuff, people are, uh, they buy these things. And they buy it from a lady uh, who works at Bob's Juice Bar. And um, we all live at the overhead. The entire, not really, doesn't feel very good either. Okay. Um, the, the, the simple answer, right, the easiest answer is to go, oh, this is people doing it because it looks cool. The truth is, we just like the lady at Bob's Juice Bar who makes them. Um, she has a, a company called Unfold, 
which was a blog and Tumblr, which is French, um, nice lady. And uh, basically, if you spend any time in Paris, you will find if you go to restaurants that uh, almost everyone is wearing one of these things. It's like standard restaurant wear nowadays. Um, just the way that like the construction, you know, car hard jeans or jeans with a little hammer thing or what everybody's wearing. Like anyone who's a professional new school cook is wearing one of these hats, deliberately overpaying, and are just choosing to be a part of a community of people that supports Trank, the way that he makes them, because he's a nice person. This is my current example of, um, which, which is dotted. This, this example is one small example of another interesting phenomenon that I could do here before we move on to reassemble our class at the future. Which is, um, does someone think of the story of the original map where the, the chip board the original map? Yeah. I don't know if you guys have read that. I mean, it's a good blog and that kind of thing. Yeah. I think it's been used for 80 years for the city and the internet stuff there. And eventually it grew and it became the IBM and 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 the IBM. In the process of making this computing device, what is curious about it from my perspective, and I want to share one anecdote, and then you guys are free to think about how the supplies comes out of it, is this underlying circuit board for these uh, for computers is typically really messy. It's ugly to all these things. And one of the interesting things about the original map was that these guys were so maniacal about making sure that every First, very first of the map, to the future that was beautiful, that they disentangled and organized all the line of circuits. Now, I think this first stop basically was a massive kind of topic in the job of this one for all the engineers, saying, look, see, no one's going to see the underlying piece. No one's going to look at this. It's like you have to take special tools to open uh, the first version of the map. So it's not even the case that that any hobbyist is going to be opening this and not seeing the inside of the circuit board. You have to take to a repair center. So the only people who really don't know about this is the infinite fraction of people who are technically capable of doing this. And the bottom line is from a design perspective, um, they're like, no, no, that's not how it's going to be. We're going to make this thing beautiful. Inside and out, every piece of it, even the side of the seat. As it turns out, it costs more to do that. And that is crazy. That's precisely what we talk about. You're supposed to harmonize transaction costs. The operations class tells you to do this. It's the easiest way to do it. The choice is B versus a penny. You always choose a penny. The choice is beveled edges are more expensive than non beveled edges. You always choose. That is how it's going to work every case of it. So I invite you to consider a little bit more of the devil's exercise when we go around and just talk. I encourage you to do two things tonight over dinner or together. I encourage you to talk story. I encourage you to talk story about your own business ideas. Sit down, talk to people about them. Do you get some narrative mode around the business ideas you have? And you would have shared them in class had they been prepared. So I encourage you to talk story amongst yourself. About that. And the second top story exercise in communication is one where you think about the businesses that you admire most, the ones that you think are the most interesting, the ones that are the most inspiring to you, the ones that you wish you would have either been a part of earlier than you did. And I guarantee you, large chunks of those businesses do not operate on a transaction economics in the market. They all have a little Another favorite piece of crazy that I like is unlike traditional approaches to uh, sponsored athletes, where you have your sponsored athletes wear all your funny clothing and go off and do media stuff like that, like Red Bull athletes or whatever. Patagonia has its own athletes, right? And you can probably go look on the website. They're all ambassadors. And their ambassadors are 
not for the dead, and they are not in the dead. And they're not designed to do any of those things. Having them in the center pays them six figure salaries not to participate in videos, not to talk about products, not to show up on trade shows. It's simply to keep doing what it is that they're doing. They get no marketing value. And that is precisely the thing. They do a little R and D. What's that? They do a little R and D right. for them. They do a little R and D, right? The point your business mind is forcing you to come up with some reason why they do it. Well, right. I, I've looked at their videos, and they have them saying, "Oh, I love these yeah. trunks because of X, Y, and Z." Minimal intervention <laughs> from these guys. They're absolutely right. They provide great R and D. They do a bunch of other stuff. But fundamentally, right? If you're a marketing person, there's so much more yeah. leverage that you should be getting out of these people. That they're, not they're simply giving them money. It's like the MacArthur Genius Grant of outdoor activity. Right? Someone who's just giving these guys a genius grant to go out and do what it is that they do. I look at that and go, man, I wish I would have done that. That's a good business. So I'm just simply saying the second storytelling exercise is just consider all the businesses that you really are excited about, the ones that you really know about, they do not operate on a traditional business model logic. They operate more like this than less than like this. So as you're thinking about your elementary concepts, the three things that you can think about. One is Imagine decoupling the physical part of your business from its underlying economic logic and say, what would happen if I just gave this away for free? Now, I know that that's not possible, but let's just pretend for a moment, just for kids, let's pretend that we can give it Let's pretend for a moment that we can create a gift exchange in which a bunch of strangers will give a bunch of other strangers stuff. Now, I know that's ridiculous, it would never work, but let's pretend, just for kids, that the world would look like if it weren't a transaction in the world in which Things didn't operate that way. And the truth of the matter is, humans are not homo economicus, they do not operate that way. That is not what drives human beings. What drives human beings is community. So the interesting questions become how it is that you can build these interesting communities. And so, as a point of departure for this evening, and I like, want to put this now on the slides and I encourage you to consider, is like consider that businesses are social systems that are in the process of building and enrolling the communities and what it is. As it, right? And so the process of seeking product market fit is actually less a matter of direct testing and experimentation and more a matter of demand. Just something to think about. So, can I talk briefly about the, uh, the idea for next week? Okay. So, so in the appendix of the slides, which are on canvas. There is a one slide, I think it's the third slide in, that has a list of potential screening criteria that you can use to think about the business. Just take that as a given for a moment. Just pretend it's actually there. It is there for these potential. And, and that's one alternative economic driven, straight out of central casting, businessy set of screening criteria. Nothing wrong or right about it, it's just a set. Right? Dan has given you a set of screening criteria as well that are that are a different logic. One of the is a happiness logic. The question of is this fun? Does this make mayhem? Does it make the world a better place? So you have two sets of screening criteria. The first is largely conventional and totally appropriate and economic driven. And the second set is Social driven, it is non primarily not economically driven, and you have both of them. And my request since next week's lecture, so the lecture I'm going to be providing next week on uh, in videos and slides, and our guest speaker next week is all about where venture ideas come from and how to screen them. So I encourage you to get on the court this week with the ideas that you have, picking one of them, thinking about how you want to screen it. Emotionless about you know, the way that you choose to screen it, screen that idea, and then describe it in two different ways. Does that help answer your question about what I'm describing? Okay. So the important activities that you all want people to engage in is before we even begin to have a conversation about the screening, which we're going to do next week, <coughs> getting on the board and attempting to screen the ideas that you have. See what you learn. Then we're going to be together, build on our learning. Meet Darren Lee from Proofpoint, 
who's going to talk to us about business ideas and screening, and then we're going to move on from there. And that is what I'm arguing in the next week. Because I think we'll all, I think that works. Is that, a, is there, is anyone dissatisfied, confused, or has objections to that? It's, a, it's okay if you do. I just want to get out. No. Okay, so what, um, and the, the date for that, having that screen venture idea complete is the, what be? Yeah, I now understand that, like, if you just said, don't deviate from the Thursday deliverable day, then the world will freaking end. Right? <laughs> the world will just explode. Everyone's like, ah! And I don't want to. I don't want to make it hard. Right? I'm not. The goal is not to trick you or make it difficult. The goal is to facilitate learning. So that's how that's going to roll. Um, so if you have additional questions you need about the course, you can chat with me here or at Stone Ground in like 25 minutes. We'll all head down that way.